thank the organizers and Nicholas Ripke in particular for inviting me personally. When he invited me, I told him, but I'm not really working on the question of Blumenbach and race. And he said, well, if you're writing anything on Blumenbach, bring that and that'll be fine. So what I'm going to do is shift gears here and talk about something quite different from what uh, we did this morning. Uh, it's going to be a, a sort of internecine historiographical kind of paper that I'm going to give you. And it has to do with the question of the historicization of nature uh, in the 18th century. And I want to begin with my favorite boogeyman. That's Michel Foucault from Les Mouilles Chaux. Um, and here's Foucault's uh, magisterial pronouncement. In truth, it is so impossible for natural history to conceive of the history of nature, the epistemological arrangement delineated by the table and the continuum is so fundamental that becoming can occupy nothing but an intermediary place measured out for it solely by the requirements of the whole." Unquote. Well, that's, as we say in America, a crock. Okay? Instead, I'm going to pick a fight with a much more respectable, I think, position. And that's the one articulated by Martin Rudwick in what I take to be the greatest history of geology of this period, Bursting the Limits of Time from 2005. And there he writes of Blumenbach the following seemingly very, very complimentary line. He says, perhaps no other naturalist anywhere in Europe was in such a favorable position for turning a traditional static natural history into a dynamic history of nature." Unquote. So here we have precisely the contraposition uh, to Foucault and the one that I'm going to, in fact, try to defend. But I'm going to defend it, ironically enough, against some reservations that Mr. Rudwick himself makes to his own seemingly highly complimentary statement about Blumbach. And my defining strategic impulse is going to be to ask, how does Blumenbach come to his sense, as I want to argue, of a historicization of nature? And I'm arguing that in that context, a key influence is Jean-André de Luc. Um, one of the things to try to do is to understand exactly what Blumenbach's sources and motivations were in the construction of his various interpretations. And I'm going to suggest that there's a very direct and important connection between Blumenbach's interest in questions of paleontology and the historicization of nature <coughs> and his reception of Deluc's great book of 1779, The Lettre Physique et Morale, Sous l'histoire de la Terre et de l'Homme. Uh, what I want to suggest is that he reads this text in 1779. We know that because he wrote a review of the book in December uh, of 1780 for the Goethe und Gelehrten Anzeigen. He reads that text in precisely the moment in which he is trying to define for himself what the field of natural history is to be going forward, as he's going to articulate it in the Handbuch and in his other work. So it's a crystallizing moment. He's not only reading De Luc, he's reading Zimmermann on biogeography. He's reading the two Forsters on the South Seas. He's reading Petrus Kampa on the orangutan and the whole question of the, uh, the ape-human relationship. But out of that, he's forging his own very personal conception of what the field of natural history was to be. And I want to suggest that that conception of natural history, at the very least, dominates the German intellectual conception of that field going forward for some time. One of the most important debates that was arising in the late 18th century in uh, in Europe, and this is something that Nicholas has written about, is precisely some interesting and perplexing fossil remnants of quadrupeds and largely vertebrates that seemed like currently existing species but weren't quite the same. One of the features that was distinguishing them is that they were so much bigger than the existing life forms. And so the question that a lot of the natural historians were asking themselves is, what do we make of this? And one of the crucial issues that comes up, and amazingly little specified in the history of science is the question of extinction. When does this idea of extinction really catch hold? Who are the conceptual uh, articulators of this notion of extinction? I'm going to argue that Blumenbach is very, very typically humble in saying, it's not my original idea. Some very famous men, he says, have proposed the idea that extinction may be possible. And I think that the evidence supports their view. And I'm going to suggest it's very important that he takes that view. 
But what I want to suggest is that de Luc is important in this context precisely because de Luc offers a perspective on geology, the emerging field of geology, that's slightly different from that that's dominant both in his ancestral Genevan context of, of Switzerland and his concern with the Alps, and in the German context of Geognosy, where the fundamental concern was with the utility of mining and therefore mine mineral veins, and therefore with the mountains that are going to contain those kinds of mineral deposits and not particularly fossils. And what I want to suggest is there's something very, very interesting in the way that uh, De Luc changes his own project, which is going to be very, very uh, fruitful for uh, Blumbach, and that is that De Luc is already writing his rather prolific half travelogue, half scientific theory about the origins of geology, when in 1779 the first volume of Horace Benedict de, de Saussure's Voyage dans les Alpes appears, becomes a tremendous bestseller, and de Luc suspends the publication of his own prolific text and alters the title. And he alters the title by removing the word montagne, which of course is the golden word in geology in the late 18th century. Why does he take it out? He takes it out because he knows Saussure's already preempted the field of the discussion of the Alps, of the formation of the mountains there, and he's going to concentrate rather, and this is going to be decisive for Blumbach, on his explorations of Hannover and the Rhine Basin and Flötzgebirge. And that's precisely where the fossils are. And that's going to be what's going to be so interesting and important for Blumbach. It's that what de Luc suggests to him is the crucial insight for <coughs> biology out of the development of geology, namely the notion that you can do something with the development of animal forms from finding their strate uh, stratigraphy relationship in terms of the geological uh, layout of mountains. So what I want to suggest is that what's really important about Blumenbach, or for Blumenbach about De Luc, is this notion of looking at Fletzgeberger and at the fossil collections and at the dating, the sequencing of fossil collections. This becomes important in his theory of extinction, but it's also important in his theory of the historical development uh, of animal forms. And I don't think there's any other source that triggers quite that set of associations in Blumenbach's mind as De Luc does. Blumbach is very well informed about what's going on in geology and other contexts, and that appears in his own work, in his reception to De Luc, but it's this stimulus, I think, that makes De Luc very important for him. One of the things that I found very amusing when I began doing this research was I went back to uh, Charles Gillespie's very, very classic work, uh, Genesis and Geology, and I found this wonderful line in there in which he says, De Luc for some reason, sent his letters to this professor Blumenbach in Germany in the 1790s. Uh, Gillespie has no idea who Blumenbach is. He could care less who Blumenbach is. And he has no interest in finding out why the hell De Luc sent those letters to Blumenbach. I suggest those letters were sent to Blumenbach not just because they met through Lichtenbach uh, in uh, De Luc's visit to Göttingen in 1776, but rather because he took Blumenbach by the time their correspondence began and after their meeting in Windsor in 1791 as one of the leading theorists of the historization of nature. He sent those letters to Blumenbach because he believed that he was sending them to one of the two or three most important theoretical peers that he could, in fact, engage with. Of course, he wanted to reach a German audience. That goes without saying. But there's something more specific there. There's a recognition of intellectual importance and I would argue even more of intellectual alliance. I think it's really important to note that in the moments before, or the, the year before, Blumenbach uh, met with de Luc in Windsor. James Hutton had become the object of Blumenbach's attention. And Blumenbach had written for the same journal in which he would publish de Luc's letters, had written an introductory essay and then a translation of a, or at least a summary of Hutton's book, highly critical of Hutton. And I suspect that when he met with de Luc in Windsor, they discussed Hutton, and it was their common displeasure with Hutton's position that motivated Blumenbach to urge de Luc concisely, 
a word that Deleuze does not understand, concisely to reformulate his position in a series of letters that he could then present to the German academic audience. From the beginning, in other words, of Blumenbach's body of work to the end, Deleuze has a very positive presence, is a figure that he takes very seriously, and that has, I think, an extremely important role uh, in Blumenbach's development and position. Now, my fight with Rudwick. Rudwick pays attention primarily to an anniversary lecture that Blumenbach gives to the Göttingen Academy in the year 1801, and then publishes in Latin in 1803. And he is very interested in that text because he sees that text as being a moment in which a very distinguished German naturalist advocates the historicization of nature and the development uh, of historical geology. But he says, this is backward and it's half-hearted. And after all, Blumenbach was just a professor at Göttingen. He's too busy teaching his classes to be a major research scholar. And therefore, this is just a kind of programmatic note. And it's also very late. The really breakthrough thought had happened with the essays of Bortin for the Taylor Museum in 1789. And of course, the great figure for Rudwick is Cuvier. Cuvier is great. No one else can really compare to Cuvier. And Blumbach is just a poor approximation. Okay? That's the fight I want to pick uh, with, with, with Rudwick. In this group, I win by default. But um, I sadly have to confess that in many other groups, I would not win by default. Taking on Rudwick and taking on Cuvier among communities of professional historians of science on behalf of Blumenbach, I think I would get rather battered. Okay, so I need to make it very clear that I'm speaking to an audience that I would hope would be at least more receptive to the general thesis than might be the case elsewhere. Rudwick argues that Blumenbach came on the scene late, that all he could do was carry forward Deluxe's two-world model all the way up to the turn of the century. So Deleuze had argued in the Lettre Philosophique that there was uh, an, a Vorwelt, to use the German word, and then the current world, separated by one catastrophic event, le déluge. Okay? And for, for Deleuze, this is very powerfully connected to scripture. What Rudwick says is that Blumenbach only comes to the notion that geological history has more than two phases, in 1799, and particularly in the Academy Lecture of 1801. And what I want to argue is that that's total nonsense. If you look carefully at the original edition of the Handbuch der Naturgeschichte from 1799, the first volume of the first edition, there's a section that doesn't appear in any of the later editions. It's section 39. And in that section, Blumenbach raises the question of extinction and raises the question of historicization. And that it not appear in any later edition is not a function of any change in Blumenbach's opinion, but rather quite the opposite. In all later editions, where there is extensive discussion of mineralogy, Blumenbach amplifies, expands, and accentuates the position that he already articulates in that one tiny section of the first volume of the first edition of the Handbuch. And this becomes, in fact, I would argue, the most fertile source of change over the many editions of the Handbuch over the next 20 years. That it's, fa in fact, the development and amplification of his thoughts about geology and its relationship to biological development through the study of fossils that becomes the most important and preoccupying theme for Blumenbach in this period, and that gets transmitted really excitingly to his best students. And I think it's not trivial to some of his best students decide to go work with Werner in the Freiburg School of Mines and do geological research. They do that because they see, through Blumenbach's teaching, the connection between geology and paleontology. And the fundamental argument of history of science is you can't do biology until you have a historical geology. And what Blumenbach does is accentuate the, necess the necessary relationship between those two fields. So I'm suggesting that Deleuc is the trigger. Reading Deleuc's text in 1779, incorporating that way of thinking into his own writing already in the first edition of the Handbuch, and then elaborating upon it over the next 20 years, 
is really decisive. And that means that it's totally wrong to think that Blumenbach is a late comer to this notion of historicization of nature and of geology. It isn't, Rudwick is wrong, it isn't Blumenbach coming late and half-heartedly to such a notion in his academy address in 1801. What he's doing in 1801 is celebrating a course of teaching, a successful course of teaching that he'd been undertaking for two decades already and produced a bevy of extraordinary students who were making tremendous advances in this course. It isn't at all the case that Blumenbach is late, it's that Blumenbach is early. And that Rudwig, like many, many other Anglophone historians of science, doesn't take Germany seriously enough. Um, that's a little unfair because Rudwig has read everything. No question. It is the question whether he's read everything correctly that I'm raising here. So the fundamental question then is, how does Blumenbach develop his ideas? And I think one of the clues is to look at the development of changes in the Handbuch uh, der Naturgeschichte over the various editions. And I think Rudwig reads them badly in that context as well. But one of the points I just made and that I want to just come back to is that one of the most fertile areas of development in those changes is in the study of fossils. And in Blumenbach's categorization and classification of fossil collections, it's also a period in which he's building up his own fossil collection here in the museum. So this is clearly a central consideration uh, for Blumenbach and, and one, I think, that, that, that's manifest in many, many venues and possibilities. And all of this, of course, comes to articulation in the Beiträge zur Naturgeschichte in the first edition uh, in 1790. What I think is really interesting is to ask what has changed between the reception of Deleuze in 1779 and the articulation of ideas in 1790. And I think the important point to make there is that Blumenbach, and I'm going to use sort of linguistic and formal terms here, but they're important, Blumenbach pluralizes everything he describes. Every phase, every aspect, every characterization is emphatically in the plural. Whereas Rudwick wanted to argue that Blumenbach had very, very monolithic conceptions, both of a Vorwelt and uh, the new world, the new creation, what in fact we read in Blumenbach's texts is an enormous sense of the proliferation and complexity of each of those domains. It isn't as though Blumenbach forsakes the idea that there is a cataclysm of extraordinary proportions. What he already in 1780 called a last judgment a total revolution, which led to mass extinction, to use a current phrase. But it's that within each phase, he sees substantial phases and developmental changes and processes, and that within these structures, he discerns what he sees to be regular patterns first of empirical evidence that can be used to reconstruct them. So this is an adamantly empiricist approach to the history of geology. And second, even more interestingly, that we can make generalizations, which is what empirical science wants to do, that we can make generalizations about the processes that were operative both in the Vorwelt and in the current world, and we can see continuities in those processes so that we have a possibility. It's not exactly what we would call actualism in the current jargon, but there are possibilities of making scientific generalizations based on empirical evidence about the way in which these processes transpire. The crucial issue for Blumenbach then becomes the question, again, of mass extinction, and even more importantly, what happens when they all die? How do new species arise? And Rudwig, quite cleverly and correctly, takes him to task for not having a good theory for that. Um, I suspect that if any of us really faced a situation in which literally all the species died and then there was a new form of life, we would have trouble explaining that too because we still haven't been able to reconstruct an origin of life account that works. And Blumenbach is not a fool. He knows he can't explain how exactly these new forms arose. 
What he does is he makes, again, an empirical case. The empirical case goes like this. These catastrophes, the one especially that he's most interested in, the, the, the great catastrophe, had to be so severe and so massive that most living things, in his view, all significant life forms, would have been extinguished. And there would be a significant interval in which the planet would be inhospitable to life, period. So that there would then have to be a new creation. And he uses that language, and he uses a reference to a divine intervention in this new creation. He's not embarrassed to use such language. And what he says is, I don't know how this could have been. I just know that it must have happened. And what, as a scientist, I can do is suggest that there are some rules that we derive from our study, empirical study, of geology and life forms in connection with them that we can use to carry that argument forward, and that is the notion of the Bildungstrieb. And what he wants to suggest is that Bildungstrieb is a natural constant force, and that the same Bildungstrieb with its same capacities existed, thanks to God's intervention, in the Vorwelt and in the New World, and that all that merely changes then is that in this New World, given that the ecology has shifted, the Richtung, I love this, the Richtung of the Bildungstrieb would have altered. Bildungstrieb, ladies and gentlemen, is a metaphor. Trieb is a metaphor. It's a metaphor can't happen to like because it humanizes nature, but it's a metaphor. When you then talk about the Richtung of the Bildungstrieb, what you're doing is adding a metaphor onto a metaphor. And to say that that's an explanation is problematic. But what Blumenbach wants to say is, if you've got this mechanism, he would hate this word, this mechanism called Bildungstrieb, and it's constant across all phases of geology, and if it can then change direction, given changes in environmental circumstances, at least you have the basis for thinking about what a good explanation might look like for accounting for what happens after episodes of mass extinction. It's not a lot, and he knows it's not a lot. It's not Darwin, and even Darwin isn't enough. Perish that thought among historians of biology. Even Darwin is not enough. But what I want to suggest is that well before Rudwig thinks that Blumenbach was sort of curious about these matters, Blumenbach had worked out one of the most advanced, complex, and I would argue persuasive models for thinking about the relationship between historical biology and historical geology, and certainly, certainly, was one of the great pioneers of the historicization of nature in Europe. Thank you very much.